This is the first in a series of videos I'll be creating to explain how to add common sense to AI, the most exciting project on the planet. This topic is the focus of the Future AI Society, and I'd like to invite you to join, even with a free membership, as well as adding a like, subscribe, and a few comments to this video so it can get broader distribution. A lot of AI is built around the idea of looking at a problem that human minds can solve and figuring out a way to solve it with computers. This approach has led to the original algorithmic chess playing programs and on to today's machine learning successes. But the approach usually starts with a challenging intelligence problem like chess playing, and this has led to our current state of some extraordinarily powerful but narrow solutions. These are systems which can solve a specific problem pretty well, but are totally lost when faced with a problem outside their narrow field, and these systems are completely devoid of common sense. In this video, I'll be exploring one way that artificial intelligence can be extended towards common sense and human intelligence. I'm going to start with the simplest example I could think of, because I am convinced that you can't achieve the more complex adult-level common sense without first building the simpler common sense of a child. I'm going to ask and answer, how could human brain structures accomplish this human ability, given only neurons and synapses? And I'll compare the possible biological solution with how you might do the same thing with a computer, with AI or with more algorithmic approaches. It turns out that a plausible solution for common sense has little to do with machine learning. So if you're experienced with machine learning, suspend all that useful knowledge for the time being and strap in for a completely different approach in this series. I'm going to use a simple example here, and as you think of additional simple examples, suggest them in the comments section. Here's the example. Consider that I can ask you, what does Jane do? And assuming you know, you can answer that Jane is a doctor. Let's make it just a little more complex by also asking you to give me the names of three doctors. You can answer based on the current state of your memory, perhaps, Jane, Hakan, and John. I'm going to discuss two computer approaches to this problem and show you why they cannot plausibly represent how your brain does the same thing. Then I'll show you the only plausible approach your brain might use in storing and retrieving this type of information. Let's observe that the facet of common sense represented by these simple questions and answers is a problem of data representation and retrieval, not one of learning. I'm assuming your mind already knows the information involved and will be looking at its structure and searching process. We'll describe how the information might get there, that is, how your brain must learn, in a subsequent video. This contrasts with the mindset of machine learning, which is focused on the learning algorithm, while the data representation is more or less ignored. If you're a database enthusiast, you might imagine that to address the given problem, your mind contains a simple internal table of people you know and their attributes. Since the number of people you know is small by database standards, you might dispense with all the cool stuff that databases can do and just create a table in RAM of people rows and their various attribute columns. With today's computer and a table of fewer than 10,000 rows, you can easily write a program which searches sequentially down the name column to match Jane and returns the profession attribute. In the second instance, your program can search down the profession column and return the name column for the first three matches. Obviously, if you don't know Jane, or if you only know two doctors, you'll have to search the complete table to learn that. This is a pretty inefficient approach, so let me explain why I'm considering it. Could your brain be doing it this way? Well, in order to answer, you need to know just a few capabilities and limitations of neurons and synapses. First, can neurons perform the type of match function needed for the search? Yes, this is no problem, and I'll leave it as an exercise in Brain Simulator 2 to design a neural circuit which does just this. It's not too difficult. Next, could biological neurons do that sequential search? If you consider neurons as digital units, they form a functionally complete set, which can perform any logical function. And therefore, yes, 
neurons could be used to create circuitry which would search in this manner. On the other hand, the neural structure to do it would be quite complex and has never been observed in the brain. In fact, I would be thrilled if you used the brain simulator too and created a neural circuit to do this just to see how complex it would be. Aha, you might say, if you know about neural networks, we could perform all these matches in parallel and get our answer quickly. Yes, indeed, feed-forward neural networks can do the search, but then they aren't so good at other aspects of this problem. Let me point out that the continuous-valued perceptrons of artificial neural networks have only a passing similarity with biological neurons which operate with discrete spikes. I have a whole video series on how perceptrons and neurons are different and how AI is not like your brain. The greatest issue arises when we consider how a single neural network might address both the first and the second questions. If we were to imagine that we have perceptrons representing John, Jane, and Hakan, and others representing Dr. Lawyer and Indian Chief, your network can have a connection from Jane to Doctor or from Doctor to Jane, but not both. The artificial neural network doesn't allow for connections which do not go from one layer to the subsequent layer, partly because the machine learning algorithms won't work if you do. So what's the most likely solution? It's a graph. For this video, you can think knowledge graph if you know what those are, but in subsequent videos, I'll show you a few problems your mind solves easily, which a knowledge graph cannot. So what's a graph? It's a structure of nodes connected by edges. Now we're freed from the limitations on what nodes can connect to which others, and we can set up our data like this. In a general graph, nodes can have labels and edges have types. Obviously in your brain, they don't. But that's not an issue with today's explanation, and labels sure make things easier to understand. So you might have an edge which represents the relationship that John is a doctor, another that Jane is a person. I have created such a graph in simulated neurons in the brain simulator and it looks like this. If there is sufficient interest, I'll create a video which goes into detail on how it works, but key conclusions are that the nodes must be composed of clusters of neurons and cannot be represented by individual neurons. Further, edges cannot be individual synapses but must include yet more neurons. As a quick example as to why, if you have a single synapse connecting Jane to Doctor and another connecting Doctor back to Jane, whenever the Jane node fires, it will cause the Doctor node to fire, which in turn causes the Jane node to fire, etc. This type of uncontrolled firing in the human brain is what causes seizures. So it is certainly undesirable, but also completely plausible. While an optimal solution could be created with about a dozen neurons per node and a few more per edge, it is reasonable to conclude that nodes correspond to observed cortical columns with about a hundred neurons each. The staggering conclusion is that with 16 billion neurons in your neocortex, your brain could represent a graph with a maximum of 160 million nodes, with some estimates going much lower. While 160 million is a large number, implementing a graph with that many nodes is well within the scope of today's powerful desktop computers. A dramatic data point when considering how soon human-level intelligence might be created in machines. So how does the existence of a graph in the human brain lead to common sense? For that, I'll introduce you to an excellent book by Brackman and Levesque which I'll explore in much more detail in future videos. In the interim, a link to the book can be found on the Society website and in the description below. The book not only elaborates on the use of a graph structure for common sense, but presents practical definitions for common sense itself. The point of this video has been to show that today's main AI techniques have very little to do with how your brain solves similar problems and that a general graph structure is an essential first step to adding common sense to AI. In future videos, I'll provide details of our implementation of the graph structure, which we call the Universal Knowledge Store, or UKS, 
and how it has been created in the Brain Simulator 3, thinking of the human brain structure in terms of a graph radically reduces the magnitude of the common sense problem and when we might expect it to be introduced. I know I've just scratched the surface with this first video. If you're interested in seeing more, be sure to like, subscribe, and comment. To learn more about the Brain Simulator 2 and the upcoming Brain Simulator 3, and to support their continued development, be sure to join the Future AI Society. I look forward to interacting with you directly through the Society, and of course, thanks for watching.